Uh, at this time, on our series of uh, IEP speakers, we have Jerry, Dr. Jerry Pickering, uh, representing the Allegheny Arboretum, here to talk about Confluence Park. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, the Allegheny Arboretum uh, is an entire IEP campus. And before we really talk about the Arboretum and the Confluence Park, I want to talk a little bit about sustainability. That's why we're here. Uh, and when I was asked to give a talk here, I thought, well, well, I know a little bit about sustainability, so I guess I'll Wikipedia. And this is what I found. There are three main colors of sustainability, economic, environmental, and social. The three Ps, profits, planet, and people. These are the pillars that support the goals of sustainability to safely exist on Earth over a long period of time and to maintain a healthy and biocapacity of the environment. To maintain a health and biocapacity of the environment. My question was, well, does the Allegheny Arboretum uh, support and fulfill these requirements of what we would call sustainability, particularly profits? the planet, and the people, the three Ps. Well, let's see if it does, in fact. But before we do that, I want to give you a little bit of information about the Allegheny Arboretum and IUP. Interesting, we were talking with some people before I came in here, and we asked them, do you know anything about the Arboretum? Uh, no. That doesn't surprise me. So here's uh, some information about the background of the Arboretum at IUP. It was established in 2000 by then uh, President Larry Pettit, in 05, we became actually a part of the university, a little square over here. We're part of the, administered by the Vice President of Administration and Finance, basically under the Facilities Department. In uh, 2014, we officially became an arboretum. We received accreditation from the ArbNet, which is an international organization that uh, gives arboretum uh, a ranking um, and we're the lowest level, a, a level one, but we are officially recognized as an arboretum uh, across the country. In 2015, Best College Review uh, looked at the top 50 university arboretums across the United States. Yes, there are a lot of arboretums at universities. And surprisingly, the Allegheny Arboretum was ranked the 10th most beautiful campus uh, Arboretum across the country. In uh, 2017, uh, the Arboretum Board uh, applied for and received a grant uh, to fund the development of the Confluence Discovery Park Master Plan, which I'll talk a little bit more later in detail. Uh, and two years later, in 2019, that plan was developed. Uh, in uh, 2020, the Indiana County League of Women Voters uh, selected the Arboretum to receive the Environmental Leadership Award, which we were greatly glad, glad to receive. And then this year, the Arboretum Board hired the consulting group, our group out of Hershey, Pennsylvania, to evaluate the more than 20 environmental studies that have been done on the Confluence Discovery Site properties. Therefore, this has never been done. Uh, by anybody. Uh, IUP has paid for and has all of these environmental studies. There's a lot of stuff down there, but this company is going to be in the process right now of evaluating these, and they, by the end of the year, will come up with an action plan for us to consider and help us move forward in the development of the Confluence Discovery Park, which we will talk about here in just a few minutes. Well, first of all, Let's look at IUP. Uh, this is the master plan of developed by IUP in 2011. This is a 20 year plan. Uh, and the Arboretum, remember, consists of the entire campus. I want to look at a particular a region uh, in the south part of the campus. It's this region here, which is a green space uh, right below the stadium, right below uh, the Hilton Garden Inn. Uh, we see it's kind of a uh, green area with trees and some waterways, trails. So at least IUP recognizes this as a green space. 
that they had no major plans for development of buildings or grounds or anything like that. Uh, the only thing that they major thing that they did was to put in a parking lot along Wayne Avenue for particularly the Hilton Garden Inn. So this area is the site of the proposed Confluence Discovery Park, right below the Hilton Garden Inn. And I want to point out also, here's the railroad track that goes through this area. And it, the, the Confluence Park occupies that Northwest region, which was a salvage yard at one time. Oh, speaking of that, what did this area uh, really look like in terms of the hydrology, which is really the backbone of the site. Thus, we call it Confluence Discovery Park. We see there are three main runs. We have White's Run coming in from the Northwest, uh, or excuse me, Stony Run coming in from the Northwest. We have the confluence of the White's Run, which originates in White's Woods, come down and come flows into the Stony Run. And then we, very importantly, we have Marsh Run coming in from the borough. And they all come together right in the middle of the confluence park. Remember, these are three watersheds in a slight, this is the base of the funnel. They all come together right here. So one of the most important components of the Confluence Discovery Park is stormwater management, because we know there are a lot of problems with stormwater in the borough and in White Township. I also want to point out another important part of the hydrology of the area, and this is the uh, Confluence wetland right here. I'll point uh, this out to you in one of the pictures coming up. So this is really a, a, the key part of the park and of the campus are these three runs that all flow together, thus conflicts. Now, if we look at the past history of this site, what do we see? Well, boy, it's a really a multi-industrial and it is a brownfield site. There are all kinds of things that have been left in the soil in these areas. Uh, to orient yourself, uh, to your left is south, and we find here, uh, here's the football stadium, and look at this area here. This is Wayne Avenue, the railroad track, and we see here that this has been a home of a multitude of industries, uh, some not so good, salvage yards, uh, scrap metal, uh, automobiles, and interesting, it was the home also of the first fast food place here, Wendy's. I can remember when it opened up, cars were lined all the way around. That was a big thing. So this is really uh, an area that has been utilized by a variety of industries, and they've left a lot of bad stuff in the soil. Now, if we... Uh, Take a, another look at this, kind of the past and then the current. On your uh, left is an aerial view of the confluence site. Uh, and this is from 07. And what do you see? A pile of junk, really. This is salvage material. Uh, you see all the roads that are kind of going through the area. Up here is the bomb property, which is also salvage. Uh, and you really can't see the confluence of Marsh Run and Stony Run very well at all. Uh, you can see where, uh, here's where Stony Run's coming in. You can see the trees here, but look at all this. That's what uh, we were, people would love coming to Indiana, and this is what they would see. Uh, and uh, today, though, look how it's changed. It's all green just about. Uh, now, part of this is due to the fact that when they did the Hilton Garden Inn, they basically packed everything. Rather than disturbing the soil, which they did minimally when they built the Hilton Garden Inn, they basically put a layer of soil over everything. You know, what you do when you have a dirty floor? You sweep the dirt under the rug. That's kind of what they did. They just covered it. But life has come back. Green has come back. And life has come back. How do we know that? Well, to understand that, this is an area of view looking south. The confluence would be just out of your view to the left. 
On the right, you can see the confluence wetland, which is really a, a what I call an ephemeral stormwater basin because here we see it kind of midsummer, it's full of water. Uh, I've seen it higher than that. This spring, when we had all that rain, it was actually flowing out of the wetland, but by summer, this summer, late summer, it can be totally dry. Now, we also see the other important thing here is the biodiversity of the site. On your left, we see where that stony run lined with trees. And of course, on the right is the wetland. And in between, we have open meadow. And we have a, this creates a lot of edges for not only caused by the vegetation, but then that will support a diversity of life forms. And probably one of the best examples of that are the birds. Uh, recently, I talked with John Taylor, a former retired faculty member from geology and an ornithologist. And over the last several years, he has studied and recorded the number of birds on the confluence site. 125 different bird species he has recorded. And let me repeat that, 125. That's a lot in a small area. Here are a couple of them, the great egrets, and most interesting, the yellow crown night heron. Only time it's been reported in Indiana County, and the first time was at the confluence, proposed confluence site. Why? Biodiversity and the vegetation and the wetlands. And it supports a lot of birds coming in in the spring and the fall, or in the fall that are migrating through. It's because, again, of the confluence wetland that's there. So we see that there's been some recovery, so to speak, without a lot of effort. Well, what are we proposing uh, for the actual confluence discovery part? This is the master plan. And what we see here is uh, our runs. We have marsh coming in here. Stony Run coming in here. Here's our wetland. Uh, here's the open meadows. And there's a welcome center here. Uh, and of course, we have throughout here, along the streams, uh, at least four or five different sites where students and people can go down the edge of the runs and do classwork. One of these is handicap accessible. Uh, we have at least three bird blinds uh, of them proposed. And we have, of course, Outdoor classroom. This is uh, in the meadow area up by the northwest part. And uh, you can see outdoor classrooms and a meadow study. Here's a proposed walkway across the wetland uh, so people can get a closer view of it. Now, what is the actual mission of the master plan? Well, let's read it. To transform a historic, flooded, abandoned, industrial parcel into a multi-use and aesthetically attractive property that occupies an important gateway to the university and to our community. I say the creation of this park will be a transformational change for our university in Indiana. And we have a variety of goals that will allow us to reach that uh, particular uh, plan. Uh, we want to restore ecological health, we want to foster a new curriculum. Right now, we have an academic community committee that we have faculty and students who are already utilizing the, the Arboretum. Because the primary goal of the Arboretum and IUP is education. We want to create a shared amenity between the university and the community. We want, this is going to be constructed over a multi-phase process. We want to demonstrate innovative remediation and land restoration processes. And finally, the most, one of the most important things is to catalyze economic restoration and uh, economic development associated with the Arboretum. We know this will happen because it's been recorded in other university and Arboretum across the country. So let's go back to what we started at, the pillars of sustainability and the goals. Has the Arboretum, will the Confluence of Discovery Park support and follow fall under the, what we call the goals and the pillars of sustainability? And I say, yes, we are dealing with profits, economic development. We're encouraging people to come. 
And obviously we're talking about an improvement of the environment over a long period of time. Well, I thank you. Uh, I hope uh, in a few, uh, several years from now, you'll be able to take a walk to the Confluence Park. Uh, it's gonna take a lot of work and money. And if you would like to read uh, more about it, particularly look at the master plan, you will, I recommend you go to our website, www.edu slash arboretum. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. To demolish. The demolish foster lot for the feet. Foster put the night into a rain garden. We've been asking FDA to press on it for a while and no one's ever um, like about, um, I think IUP a few years ago uh, considered building a rain garden, but the price was something like $100,000. And under the current uh, economic situation, I think the university decided to back off on that. Uh, we've looked at other places on campus for water gardens. Uh, it's not out of the picture, but under the current economic situation, I think it's one of those things that's going on the back burner. Unfortunately, it's a reality in the world we live in. Does the plan have any plan for that foster law area? I can't answer that. I don't know. I'm not directly involved in the IUP master plan process. And it's only something when you talk about a master plan, that's something you kind of dream about. But do you get everything? Usually not. Things are flexible. Things come and go. And you have to be flexible. You try to get the main things. So. Uh, that's a good point. Though. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Brian Oki, I have been in the geography, used to be the geography and regional planning department. Now we are geography, geology, environment, and planning. I've been there for a good long time. And I have um, always looked at the community as kind of a laboratory for my environmental courses. I've taught conservation, I've taught, I'm teaching conservation. I've, uh, freshwater resources, uh, biogeographies, of course, I've developed uh, geography of energy, and I'm probably forgetting something. But um, since I've been here, I have uh, been able to, been fortunate uh, to work with people like Sean Bussler. Uh, currently, we're working with Bob Savo over the County Con Conservation District in exposing students to real life issues and problems and uh, getting them dirty. I like to get students dirty and wet and thinking about what's going on in their own environment uh, as much as some of these other places we read about. So uh, on that score, I, I typically have a field project in these courses and um, I'll show you uh, a few slides to highlight what we're doing. Well, this one uh, is a few images from Two weeks ago, we went out to Brown's Run over east of Clymer with Bob Sabo and did some macro invertebrate sampling. Uh, Upper Two Lake has got some mine drainage. And uh, this semester, I opted to work with the County Conservation District and do a little bit of uh, sampling up there. I think we're scheduled to go out Tuesday. This is the third rescheduling. You know, the weather has not been easy to work with this semester, but that's that's kind of the nature of it. In fact, uh, the Confluence Park is exciting because one of the biggest obstacles to a community laboratory is you can't very well get out there and do much within the space of class time. So you have to you have to be creative with time and you have to work with students and you have to uh, orchestrate these field excursions. And that's hard, but having something like this on campus will be tremendous. It'll be a huge opportunity. Um, so macroinvertebrate sampling is going on. Uh, White's Woods is, is one of our laboratories. I've used White's Woods off and on uh, for a few years. In fact, uh, Jerry took my students out with me and, and uh, helped to uh, shed some insights uh, on the park uh, years ago. And it's been an ongoing uh, source of debate as uh, many of you in the community are aware. Uh, so uh, I, this morning, was out with some of my students who are going to try to put out wildlife cameras and, and uh, try and do some uh, exploratory work on the deer population. Uh, I've got another grad student who has um, 
taken on an invasive plants project as well. She'll probably look at Barbary in the park. So uh, these are some things we're doing this semester. Oh, uh, last summer, I worked with Amber Lawrence. Actually, she did it mostly herself. I wound up being away for much of the summer. But uh, some of you are familiar with the work that she did surveying attitudes about use of white woods and uh, various proposals to, to timber or hunt or, or other things. Uh, and she, she got some data. I think she did around 200 interviews uh, hanging out around the entrance park over the course of the summer. So that was a, uh, a USOR project, uh, an undergraduate funded project uh, of which there were several this, this past summer. So when we can get away with it, my um, colleague, Dr. Sudesh Ghosh and I have gone to uh, India. We've done this on three occasions, mainly thanks to her uh, connections. I, I kind of tag along and, and try to appear useful, but uh, really we are, uh, we are taking advantage of, of the tremendous uh, working relationship we've been able to develop with her alma mater, Indian Institute of Technology at Karakpur near Kolkata. And we have uh, gone three times. And um, the second time, each time we, we don't want these trips to be kind of tourist excursions where you take pictures and gawk at the landscape. They've all involved some measure of uh, observation and, and data uh, collection. It's very hard to, to plan and do that when you're only there for uh, maximum of two weeks and you don't even get to see the place until you're actually there and have to have to collect data but um, the uh, second trip we went to Darjeeling up in the Himalayan foothills and uh, anybody that's heard the word Darjeeling is, is probably a tea drinker uh, we are standing there in a tea garden one of the larger operations and it is operated by a fellow named uh, Raja Banerjee who's a very progressive uh, forward-thinking fellow and this is an organic operation and kind of alluding back to the community garden food forest kind of concept, intercropping and, and utilizing the um, natural ecological interactions among trees and, and plants and, and uh, soil microbes and all of that uh, is well in effect here. They are, uh, you know, they're organic and they are facing the early effects of climate change in Darjeeling. They're starting to see effects on tea cultivation. The use of trees perhaps is a way to shade and shelter uh, the tea gardens under these changing circumstances. You know, it's, it's early to see how this will play out. But, uh, you know, alluding back to the three Ps that, that Jerry mentioned, uh, the, uh, what were, Planet, planet people and, and profit. Okay, well, this is a profitable enterprise. There's no doubt. Uh, as far as the planet, uh, I, they are using natural interactions to produce the product and they are sustaining wildlife biodiversity uh, in these tea gardens. Uh, people, you see there are those women with their baskets of leaves. Interestingly, whereas much agriculture globally has become mechanized, uh, under many different contexts. Uh, mechanization is difficult here because of the steep slopes. Uh, so steep that it's difficult to mechanize the harvest of the tea leaves. So it's still done by human hand. And uh, uh, Mr. Banerjee uh, employs women because he finds them more reliable. So this is a very, <laughs> this is a very um, steady and, and uh, decent uh, economic stream for these uh, women in this community who collect the tea leaves and he's actually um, gradually, I, I think, transitioning the operation over to community ownership. That is his long-term vision, is to put it in the ownership of the people actually working, uh, working the land. So it's, uh, you know, that's one of many examples we've looked at in India. We have gone to uh, Rajasthan in the, the desert Northwest recently. We've also looked at the city of Kolkata, and, and if I start talking about Kolkata, I'll, I'll, I'll use up everybody else's time. So I will move on, but uh, yeah, we're hoping to do it again. We, we have to see if we'll have uh, numbers of students. Uh, COVID obviously really uh, overturned this, this kind of a thing, and, and we're exploring trying to do it in 23. We don't know if we'll be able to. This is John Barnes. He was a student intern last summer. We have an internship program, which beyond the classroom has been very effective at 
uh, getting students engaged in sustainability stuff on one level or, or another. We are, are very uh, grateful to the connections we've developed with uh, Westmoreland County, uh, Jeff Rakes and, and uh, Josh Krug is currently uh, at the helm of uh, our, our efforts with the county, Indiana County office. So it's, it's a, a reliable and steady and, and good experience for many of our students. Uh, John, John did something uh, uh, on a whole other order of magnitude and went out to Colorado. He worked for AmeriCorps uh, with the Forest Service. He was at White River National Forest. And his, um, uh, well, he was there for uh, the, the duration of the summer and he did a lot of different things, but uh, I, I wanna highlight one of the most interesting things he did. And, and again, getting back to kind of the people part of things is that the Forest Service uh, manages access to rafting on the white on the river and, and the Colorado River, uh, ultimately. And a lot of the big concessionaires, the, the companies go in and they have kind of privileged access to the water. And in times uh, of limited use, some of the local citizens, the, the private people kind of get shoved out of the way and have not had as, as good access. And so John and his fellow interns in, in putting up with the gripes and grievances of these folks, because they are on the ground and, and telling people, well, do you have a permit or you can't do this or, and so he and his, his fellow interns kind of got fed up with, with the situation and they proposed a, a more, what they thought was a better permitting system for the, the local people, the non, you know, professional contracting people uh, to use the river and, and um, actually got the attention of the forest manager, uh, kind of uh, unusual for them to listen to anybody, let alone interns. And so their ideas for this, this new permitting system are actually uh, uh, kind of being implemented. So that is, uh, that's pretty remarkable. So John's a, a, a interesting guy and, and uh, he, um, he made a big impression out there. And this is my last slide, is it? Yeah, this is, this is the last one. We have, uh, uh, Dr. Nate McElroy in chemistry and I have, have uh, over 11 years worked with municipal authority of Westmoreland County to monitor uh, water quality uh, in tributaries and drainages flowing into Beaver Run Reservoir, and we've done sampling in the reservoir itself. And if you're familiar with the area, there uh, are seven active shale gas pads within uh, a quarter mile or so of the reservoir. And um, obviously it's a big concern with, with a water resource that serves 130,000 or more people. And so we were, um, uh, we, we contracted with the authority in 2011, and uh, we have, have concluded that work. Uh, they are kind of taking on some more responsibilities now, but uh, four times a year, uh, you know, I, my students and I marched around these gas well pads and uh, also along some of the more accessible tributaries, and we did field testing and, and also took some sab uh, samples for lab analysis to, to do some general monitoring of surface water. And uh, Nate would have to talk to you more about the, the chemistry measurements, but uh, we were looking at pretty basic parameters like conductivity and pH to determine if there was anything unusual or that, that didn't look like you know, background levels. So um, uh, that has exposed many, many students to practical skills and experience that have helped uh, award some of them with uh, jobs. Uh, Lupe standing on the right uh, went on to uh, some uh, some excellent graduate work at uh, I think Arizona State and then maybe she uh, moved to Boston. I, I kind of lost track of where she wound up, but she uh, she has gone on for grad work. Uh, other students involved in this sampling have have done PhDs and and uh, one works for EPA. So it's been a good good testing ground and and. Uh, a set of experiences for students. So I'm uh, afraid I'm, I'm probably beyond my time allotment or, or close. So I will wind up there. Hi hey everyone, I'm Bea Harrington. Uh, I'm a professor of woodworking here at IUP in the Department of Art and Design. Just started my 11th year here. Um, and since 2014, I've been the director of the Wood Center. Um, it still amazes me that a lot of people in the community and even people across campus don't know that we have a woodworking program here. Um, it's kind of exceptional to have 
a standalone woodworking program on a university campus in an art department. Um, often the woodworking program is just part of the sculpture area. Um, so we're one of, I don't know off the top of my head, but I want to say a dozen, maybe standalone wood programs across the country. Um, and that's why I ended up here. Uh, and um, so first of all, I want to thank Amanda and Tammy put this summit together for including us. Um, we're going to be a little bit less, my presentation will be a little bit less scientific and involved in the experimental or, you know, that kind of part of sustainability. Um, and we may be, what, maybe what we do is more of the, the public face of sustainability. And um, what we are able to offer to students is a firsthand experience of the tree, the lumber, the object life cycle, which ultimately does have to do with sustainability. So one of our partners actually is the Allegheny, our main partner is the Allegheny Arboretum that Jerry is the director of. So what we do is my predecessor, Chris Weiland, who taught here for 31 years, um, with a bunch of grant money that he got to actually start the Wood Center. And I think Jerry might know this 2008 or 2009 purchased um, a major piece of equipment um, called a, a portable bandsaw mill. And what that allows us to do is take trees that are felled on campus and mill those into lumber, into boards that are then able to be used by students in the art department in the Wood Center in projects of their own, in addition to projects that have been done across campus. So um, I don't have a handout for you. I wish I would. So what I don't have images. What, what I'm going to do here is send you off from here on a scavenger hunt across campus. Um, first of all, to go in and look at the oak grove and see some of the recent trees that came down, which I think there's still stumps there. Um, there's a huge black oak near the library near the library in the Performing Arts Center, near sort of library in Fisher Hall, which was a black oak that was diseased. You'll see when you look at the stump, it's completely hollow inside. So trees have to come on down on campus for various reasons, right? Most of those, some of those are due to disease because diseased trees create a safety issue, um, not only for other trees, but also because they might, you know, come down and injure someone or damage a building or something like that. Um, trees also, the other main reason that trees come down is construction. People don't like trees coming down. So, <laughs> for whatever reason, people don't like trees coming down. Um, and the Arboretum, hands off to, hats off to the Arboretum, does an excellent job of planting new trees. And in fact, one of the recent projects is to replace all of the trees that came down for the Kopchik building. I write in the journal. And so we're replacing all of the species of trees that came down there. So what we're able to do is take any tree that comes down on campus. And I always try to make clear, we never cut down a tree on campus, which is the Allegheny Arboretum. All the trees on campus are part of the Allegheny Arboretum. We never cut down a tree for the purposes of milling it up into lumber. What we do is use the trees that are coming down anyway, any of them that are sizable enough um, and actually some of them are too big for our mill. We can't mill them and we have to sell them or find someone else to mill them. But any of the trees that are sizable enough, we mill into lumber and then we store, we um, we have to dry that lumber. So we have a drying shed out near our mill, um, which is out by Robert Shaw by the Rose Street entrance to the campus. You'll see our little drying shed and the wood miser portable bandsaw mill is out there as well. When you air dry lumber, which is what we do, commercially now lumber is kiln dried. So Lumber's cut, all the wood is stacked, you know, size stacked, put in a big, huge oven, a kiln, and dried in, depending on the thickness of it, maybe two weeks. For us, we air dry all our lumber because we don't have a kiln. So that means it takes one year per inch of thickness to dry a board. So this is also. Um, an amazing opportunity to allow students to see sort of slow technology at work and the benefits of slow technology. So one of the things that I say to my students is, 
When you think of the lumber that we have and that we get to use, it's a little bit like if you compare it to the commercial lumber industry and going to a lumber yard and saying you are going to build a maple table and you need two inch thick stock for your legs and inch thick stock for the aprons that go all the way around. Um, and then maybe four boards that are an inch thick that are, you know, eight inches wide or so to glue together to make the top. You're going to go to the lumber yard and go find the eight quarter, two inch thick. They have to do math, which is a real struggle these days. But anyway, two inch thick lumber for legs, one inch thick lumber for the other parts. And you're going to just go find a bin of maple that varying sizes. It's a little bit like when you go to the grocery store and buy a gallon of Dean milk. How many cows milk is in that gallon that you're buying? And where did that milk come from across the country, right? It's a little bit like that when you go to the lumber yard and go use the commercial lumber industry compared to what we're allowed to do here. So here a student can build a bench out of one log where all the lumber came from that one tree. That's a very different kind of way of using material and understanding material. And so it's not just not just students projects, not just student projects, but we've also done various projects across campus. A lot of them are benches. Um, so I'm going to send you off to look. There are benches in the um, Performing Arts Center in the glass atrium area that connects Fisher Auditorium to Waller Hall. Um, there's a bench that was designed by my predecessor, Chris Weiland, and built by Chris and several students before I even came here that were built from a tree that was standing in the oak grove that that atrium was actually supposed to look out on. And then eventually that tree was deemed diseased and had to come down. And so that lumber was processed and um, the Performing Arts Center commissioned the Wood Center to design and build a bench. So now there are a couple of benches over there and we have one down in Sprawls as well. Also, if you go down into Sprawls Hall, which is where the art department lives, down in the basement where the Wood Center is, there are several benches um, on that ground level that are all the oak benches down there are made from campus lumber. Um, there's also an oak bench um, that was part of a design collaboration that we did with Blaine Bessey, who is an alumnus of IUP. Um, he just retired recently as one of the directors of the Library of Congress. And he's a huge donor to IEP. He just recently um, partnered with uh, Rosalie Rothman and donated um, the funds to establish finally the Mythology Center um, that's now housed in the Jim Leonard Hall on the fifth floor. Fifth floor? Okay. Um, and before that, Lane had come to the Wood Center and was really intrigued by what we did and wanted to commission a bench that he called the Sutton Bench, that we ran a design project with the advanced wood class so that they got, the students got, you know, hands-on real life experience, working with a client, designing, and then building a bench. And um, after we built the bench for Blaine and dedicated that, uh, Aramark decided that they wanted to commission another bench to memorialize a, an employee of theirs who had died that spring. So there's also another Sutton Bench in the Crimson Cafe, right outside of the Starbucks. So in the Crimson Cafe area, just on the other side of the Starbucks against the wall is one of those benches. And it has a wonderful um, laser engraved image on the back of the bench. Um, that was an image that another art student took in the Oak Grove, a panoramic image of the Oak Grove that spring with the leaves and the trees just, you know, in that, that sort of lacy, effect that they have when the leaves are just starting to come out. Um, so that's the scavenger hunt. You guys can go out in the Oak Grove and see the trees that have come down, um, see the, the various benches across campus. Um, but also, uh, you know, when we're talking about IUP and um, going on a bit of a limb here, no administration here maybe, um, you know, when budgets are cut, these are the kind of things that are hard to maintain. Uh, she talked about the 
tree donations, which I think is an awesome way, especially if you're doing something that, you know, uh, people have a lot of emotions towards their trees, a lot of mentality. Uh, so I think that's lovely. Uh, do you do any workshops to engage local residents? Um, like uh, anything to train local novices? Uh, Right now we don't, and it would be complicated to do that actually on the the wood miser, the bandsaw mill itself. For one thing, it's a really expensive machine. So the chances of individuals owning one of there are a few around, but that but um it is my intention to open up the Wood Center to more community programming. IEP used to have an extended studies program. Now, it's, there are still non-credit classes, and I'm working with those people to figure out how to, but we don't have a graduate program in the art department anymore. So that would have been an outlet for grad students to be able to teach classes to local community members, but we don't have that but there but there are some ways that yeah that we could do this. Dr. Larkin would probably be very helpful with that. Dr. Larkin in biology. He that's basically his main focus is sustainability and cutting down trees and planting them and regrowing them and working with community leaders. If you partner with him, it would probably be very helpful. So I have that brings up, I have done some work with um, Dr. Michael Terry, who's in the biology department. And one of the things we're doing right now is trying to get, get sections of the big black oak that came down, which is it's hard to get a true um, cross cut sample of that because it was so diseased and rotted inside, but we're trying to get a sample of it that will let us um, age that tree, and figure out when, because IEP has, it's 150th anniversary coming up. So if that tree was here 150 years ago, that you know that could be a really cool thing to market. But to those two giant oh, the Kutsura. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. So um, next semester in the spring, the woodworking classes are going to do a design build project with um, administration in the in capture call with the lumber from those two trees. So yes, we were able to mill those up and the lumber's dry enough now. Um, and that lumber, we had to do a little bit of research and figure it out. It's similar to what, what we have here as poplar. So it's on the soft side of hard, the kind of hardwoods that you use for furniture. But it's still what it's used for furniture. Yeah, so that's a project that we'll be doing next spring. It's designing benches for the Kapcha call made from the lumber from those two giant Katsura trees that she not just sadly had to come down. Hello. Good afternoon, folks. Um, I, won't, I won't take up too much of your time. I think uh, we're, we're wrapping up here at the end. Um, uh, my name is Joe Townsend. I'm in the biology department. Uh, I just want to take a few minutes to talk a little bit about uh, maybe trying to pull our perspective out a little bit and think about internationalization of, of sustainability. Um, I was grateful to hear uh, Dr. Oki mention their program in India and, and the impact that having those international experiences, even when they were short, just like one, two week experiences, uh, how important those are for students and how it changes perspective and it kind of opens up their ideas and thinking about uh, approaches to a lot of problems, but particularly when we think about things that relate to sustainability, to, to building uh, sustainable societies, but really when we think kind of what we're doing here today, thinking about sustainable communities first, and how do we go from maybe a household or a food forest perspective all the way up to uh, maybe like a full-on sort of society, regional, national perspective. Um, so why think about internationalization when we're worried about uh, local scale problems? Um, so I, for me, internationalization, international education does two things for students. Um, one is, is providing students with a different and expansive sort of perspective, one that they don't gain from um, kind of the typical educational experiences of working in classrooms or even working locally um, on, on projects um, like we all do um, in, you know, in the Indiana area. Um, it helps them have kind of an expansive view of problems and maybe gain perspectives they wouldn't otherwise have. 
developing, you know, hopefully more of a holistic approach to sustainability. Uh, the second is how do we how do we try to link things that we're we're thinking about or problems we're facing here locally? How do we link those to other communities that maybe are facing similar problems or have come up with novel approaches to some of those problems? And I think through this kind of building of, of whether it's building international connections or really breaking down maybe the barriers that students feel as they become professionals to reaching out across borders or reaching out across even you know even regions of the country. Um, I think having those kind of international type experiences for students helps to do that. It helps to open up that mindset and perspective. Um, so at IEP, we do that in a number of ways. What I'll focus on you know, quickly here today is to just think about um, education abroad course opportunities, um, like the opportunity in India that, that we just heard a little bit about. Um, we were lucky enough last year to, to actually initiate and start a new study abroad program um, in Honduras focused on sustainability and biodiversity. Um, as, as was mentioned, you know, we're coming out of, a, of an era where obviously international travel is certainly not something that was, uh, was being widely practiced and we weren't really obviously encouraging people to try to travel a lot. As we come out of that period and we're kind of looking at what the world looks like in this, um, you know, I hesitate to call it post-pandemic yet, we're, we're on the verge of it, but you know, I, I don't want to fully kind of commit to the fact that we are. Um, but as we move into that period, the world looks a lot different coming out of the pandemic period as it did going in. Um, and all of our efforts to try to think about how we might go back to the way things were, as, as nice as it is to feel that way and as comforting, it really makes more sense to think more about how bad things change and how we work within this new, um, I kind of hate the phrase new normal, but the new normal that we face coming out of it. Um, so talk a little bit briefly about that course. Um, so we took nine IEP students down for the summer um, to, to Honduras, which is a country that has a, a pretty poor reputation internationally. Um, if you look up Honduras travel, you're going to hear all kinds of travel uh, warnings and, um, you know, considering that it's like this violent place where you're going to be robbed in the streets. Um, all these things that, you know, from someone who had worked in this country for uh, over 20 years at this point, I know not to be true. It was like, well, how do we also break through that kind of prejudice or barrier? Um, and helping students understand that, you know, the, the snippets of things that you're seeing in the media are not captured in the full perspective of, of what's actually going on in a, a country like Honduras. Um, so students spent two weeks um, focused on biodiversity and sustainability related issues. Um, one of our host sites was Zamorano University, which is one of the premier agricultural universities in Latin America. Um, at Zamorano, students were able to, to look at uh, model commercial agricultural production. Um, this is in a tropical location, but it's of uh, higher elevation. So it's kind of a temperate tropical or subtropical setting in a tropical country. Um, in thinking about climate change and mitigating, you know, sort of changing ecosystems and weather patterns over the course of, you know, the next 50 years here, we're already kind of seeing what those uh, changes look like, like increased rainfall, uh, changes in our kind of seasonal shifts. Um, so it pays to look at, at areas that are maybe what we think of now as a little more tropical or a little more sort of subtropical than what we have here, 20 or 30, 50 years down the road, those are actually examples that may be very useful for us in thinking of how we transition agriculture. Uh, Zamorano does a nice job of looking at kind of large scale commercial agricultural production, but also looking at host home scale, um, like sort of backyard, what are called huertas, um, small agricultural production setups, basically like a community garden type of, of approach, but one that's managed at a household level and kind of contains all the aspects needed for food production at a household level. Um, they have an agroecological uh, farm, like a, a pesticide-free organic farm, um, one that uses local crops as opposed to bringing in sort of cultivars from other countries. And again, looks at the idea of how do we build sustainable farming practices that are, are place-based and very oriented to the local scale. Um, I love hearing about the, the food forest initiative um, here in Indiana because that very closely relates to these ideas. Like how do we kind of divorce ourselves from this need for importation and large supply chains for our food when we have the capacity to produce our food locally. Um, so we used the examples from those dry forests. We then took students to the uh, Yohoa Lake region of central Honduras. Um, one, to look at a tropical food forest there, when it's more uh, the kind of tropical fruits we associate with the tropics, right? Like bananas and plantains and, and citrus fruits, um, but that are part of an organic sort of forest environment. So they're not cultivated. Um, this was a, a farming practice maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago that was basically left to go fallow and turned into a food forest. Um, they left large overstory trees in and basically allowed all of the, the cultivar crops underneath to, to go uh, you know, feral, if you will, essentially to become uh, wild parts of an understory in the forest. Um, this is beneficial for birds. It's also beneficial for the people that live in the area, right? So you end up with this kind of nice tie-in between biodiversity and, and sustainability there. The real focus on our lake region, though, was to think about 
Uh, an issue that I think faces all of us when we think about sustainability, and that's common resources and how those resources can tie in um, in local areas and how they're oftentimes misused and exploited. Um, here in Indiana, we think a lot about White's Woods and as a, as a communal resource, and we're trying to figure out how to best manage that resource in a way that, that is economically beneficial, is beneficial to the community, but also benefits the environment that it's, in a sense, you know, there to protect, right? Um, Yahoo Lake is a large freshwater lake. Um, it's a resource used by all the people around it. It provides fresh water to people around it. It's irrigation for farms. Um, it's also a place for commercial fish farming. And so tilapia farming is done in the, in the lake, both at a commercial level as well as by artisanal fishermen. So here's a communal resource that no one pays to use that a company, companies have decided to set up commercial farming operations in the middle of because there's essentially no one to tell them not to do it. And so you end up with this, this conflict between a very important source of economic production, um, the tourism that goes around the lake, it's a very scenic place. And this is like a big draw for ecotourism, both locally as well as internationally. People travel to Honduras to visit this site. Um, so how do you juxtapose those different kind of stakeholders and the needs of those stakeholders to continue generating economic activity while also protecting the resource itself? Um, so I think these make really great case study, like living case studies for students to go and observe talk to people that are and interact with people working in those systems and help that to inform their perspective as a future sustainability professional. Um, one other thing I'll mention about that program is that, you know, for one thing to, to talk to a group like this about something we're doing for some of our students is nice to hear, but how does this impact Indiana? Um, so one thing that we're looking to do is expand, we're already discussing this with teachers at the middle school and high school level here at Indiana, Indiana School District, um, how to create opportunities for workshops for those teachers that go down and take, take part in these same activities so that they can inform their own teaching of, of kids here in the, in the district about these kind of issues firsthand. Um, not so much like let's show a video and you know talk about some problems some people might be having, but no, your teacher, professor so-and-so was here this summer and this is what they witnessed and what they participated in. That kind of firsthand connection is, is critical. I think that's what changes people's perspectives. I think the second part of that is to expand it beyond biology. I'm a, I'm a biologist. So for me, I always think about like, let's go work on biodiversity and let's do research projects related to ecosystems and diversity. But there's so much more to offer with systems like this. Um, so we're expanding this summer, uh, this coming summer to include anthropology students in an anthropology course, uh, focused primarily on uh, indigenous land use um, and indigenous rights and conflicts associated with some of these same kind of communal land uh, conflicts, like the conflict between international development and local scale needs. Um, so how do we continue kind of building that out, right, and allowing other people to participate and having as much impact as possible? I think for me, all this comes down to like a simple thing, right, which is that as, you know, as, as IEP or as any other university, our, our primary real goal, we'd say, is education, but really what we're trying to do is train the people that can fix these problems in the future. Um, we're thinking about sustainability issues facing our community, the region, the, the nation, the continent as a whole, and we're going we're to be in these problems together. How can we help expand the perspective, change the viewpoints of the people that will be those leaders? Um, I think we, we benefit the most by having, having a set of leaders with those broad perspectives and ideas, right? They can bring from examples that aren't local necessarily, because as our, as we've already started to see, as climate change sort of becomes the, the uh, standard, you know, the change becomes the standard for the coming decades, um, we're going to need to pull perspectives from places that we're not familiar with because our, our local environment will cease to be familiar to us. And so until we can kind of start bringing in those other perspectives, we're going to have trouble coping with those changes as they, as they sort of uh, present themselves to us. Um, so I think, I think that's about all I want to say. I want to mention, you know, this idea, right, that expanding the viewpoint and kind of wrapping up all of our local scale focus, which is where this, the focus does need to be, but looking for ways to bring in other perspectives, right? And, and to help us uh, plan for those future you know, crises or future changes as we deal with them um, with those broader uh, broader perspectives. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, this is part of your program is trying to bridge that change with perspectives on international countries and communities. Uh, what's the biggest case of a culture shock in the world? What, 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 what,
Yeah, I, I, I think it's a kind of a funny question because the students were all concerned with that same issue. I think in their pre preparation for study abroad, culture shock is something that they were really heavily kind of warned against. I had students, I, I feel like came into it thinking that culture shock was almost like a medical condition they were going to experience that by itself, like, I hope I don't get some culture shock. Um, I think the, maybe the biggest thing was being, um, and to take a step from there, I, I, half my students had never traveled internationally before. Uh, three of my eight students had never been on an airplane prior to going to Honduras with this class. And so I think some of like all of those components of simply like getting on a plane in Pittsburgh and going through the steps to arrive in another country, um, I think that alone was very shocking to a lot of them. Um, I was actually quite pleased with how the students handled the things I expected to be different. You know, it's like the food and um, the climate, you know, it was a little warmer, a little more humid there, a lot more insects. And I think they were ready for that. They had been prepared for it. And it was the things like, how do I get through customs at the airport, which actually seemed to present the most trouble for them. Um, and none of them did come down with a case of like culture shock, which they really, I had, I had two students that wrote essays where they literally said that this was like a concern of theirs and how do they avoid experiencing it. And it's like, it's not such an acute thing, right? It's more of just like, you're going to be a little uncomfortable when you travel. Things are different. People are speaking a foreign language around you. The food's different. And so as long as you're ready for those differences, uh, I think it's preparation that helps you not, you know, undergo the shock, so to speak. I just want to make one comment uh, that Joe mentioned here at the end. And uh, this goes back to the first Thursday, which I was a uh, faculty advisor for. And one of the major uh, slogans of first day was think globally, act locally. And certainly what you've done is uh, supports that uh, first Thursday. All right, uh, I want to give a big thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, you know, I really appreciate you taking time out of your three day weekend for this event and to uh, encourage and promote sustainability in Indiana County. I want to give a big thank you to the speakers. Uh, everyone did so well today. I know that we got a little bit pressed for time occasionally. Um, and you handled it all very well. Um, there's so many presentations I wish I could have heard more from. Uh, I want to give another special thank you to the volunteers. Um, not to call you guys out, but would you mind standing up? Sorry. Uh, um, you guys, uh, you know, without you being my minion uh, today, I don't know what I would have done. Uh, Probably would have lost my head. I want to give a special thanks to uh, to uh, Amanda Paul, Cindy Rogers, and Adrian Zinchek for um, their help in uh, the various ways I've had to coordinate this event, whether it be uh, helping me get this lovely venue to begin with or uh, helping me recruit speakers and EV our owners. That was a huge help. So thank you so much. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the League of Women Voters, the Indiana County Office of Planning and Development, the Sustainability Studies Program the uh, College of Mathematics and Natural Sciences and the IUP College of Humanities and Art for uh, helping sponsor this program today. Um, all of you guys have made this possible, uh, so thank you.